The botanist walks ahead and points to various sprouts on the forest floor, giving us both the Latin and the common names. We examine sepals, count petals, notice stamens. Plants are primarily organs of reproduction. Now this, the botanist says, is a real problem. He places his thumb and forefinger on the stem of a glorious rosebush in full bloom. It's an exotic. It spreads, crowds out the native species. He purses his chapped lips and frowns under his glasses, releasing the rosebush with disgust. I just learned that the barberry, a beautiful shrub that reddens each fall, constitutes yet another problem. The botanist keeps calling these recent immigrants to Eden exotics, a term that sounds politically incorrect to me. <laughs> I may be new to nature, but I always assumed it was value free. Well, except for poison ivy anyway. That's the joy of it, right? Instead, I feel as though I am entering a green world of class distinction. <laughs> How far back is native? How far back do you have to go to find the beginning? The 17th century? The forest of the pilgrims? Prehistory? George and I were in our early 60s. We'd been together for more than three years, still crazy about each other, and were too old to have children. When we heard about this preservation project, we decided to adopt a stretch of the Appalachian Trail and care for its endangered species. We spent the morning at a workshop at the Wildlife Center learning how to distinguish these species not only from common plants but also from the newcomers, mostly migrants from gardens. Our fellow conservationists included several bearded and earnest men of various ages, two single women, and a couple who had just come off a camping trip in New Hampshire. We stared at slides and we studied notebooks. It turns out the plants are threatened with extinction only in New Jersey. <laughs> they flourish in other states further north or south. This seemed to make the term endangered less dire, our task less momentous. Does it matter if one has to travel to another state to find a giant yellow hyssop? <laughs> Apparently, it does. <laughs> According to the National Forest Service official, we locate each plant, visit our stretch of trail when the plant blooms, count the number of healthy specimens, and send our findings to Washington, DC. George and I chose the section with seven endangered species. Only one of our plants is pretty, a gentian, an enclosed purple cup with a tiny white fringe. Another is a straggly beanstalk. Still another, our sedge, looks suspiciously like grass. <laughs> the tiny fold at the top distinguishes it from ordinary lawn. Counting blades of grass Sounds like an assignment for patients in a psychiatric hospital. <laughs> but I am not about to say so. Once you join a group committed to a cause, you can't expect them to laugh at it. Since our section of trail has many species and is close to the wildlife center, the botanist chose it to, to show us what to do. When we trudge along the boggy ground and over a bridge, I feel vindicated in our choice and protective of our turf. But the same moisture that nurtures our weeds also slithers under our boots. Every step releases a cloud of mosquitoes. I slather my face and hands with DEET, and when bugs fling themselves at my eyes, hover over my tucked in plastic pants, and graze at my elbows, I feel well protected. At the same time, I am beginning to worry about myself. Perhaps it's because I am no longer young, but as the late sun slants through the yellow oaks, 
I find I actually care about these fragile sprouts and want them to survive long after I do.